lot of energy around this conference, and I am just delighted, delighted to have you here joining us this evening. You know, I want to just say a couple of things about what we're trying to do. Let me tell you a little bit about the Hallenstein Center, which, by the way, is named for our benefactor, Ralph Hallenstein, 103 years old, in the front row here. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> and he's with uh, Ralph and Carolyn, and we appreciate your being here as well. You know, Ralph and I did a lot of talking over the years about what the Hallenstein Center could accomplish, and we focused on two things. We focused on a leadership academy, the Cook Leadership Academy, which gives young people the opportunity to learn the skills to navigate our democratic institutions so that they can really make a difference. The second thing that we've tried to do is create a series of lectures. We call them either the American Conversations or the Common Ground Initiative. American Conversations bring together people for whom we are pretty clear there will be no common ground. You're just gonna get a raw debate. It can be fun, we enjoy it, it can be entertaining, and also we hope always enlightening. Common Ground Initiative is, I think, intellectually more serious and challenging because we try to bring together people in the Common Ground Initiative who might be poles apart, but they have a way of being able to accept each other's premises. They can listen to each other in a respectful and rigorous manner and come away with some sense of common ground and working together. We had this, for example, on April 2nd when we brought Cornell West and Robbie George together. But at the Howenstein Center, inspired by Ralph Howenstein's vision, this is what we're committed to doing, bringing these speakers together so they're not just providing entertainment, but actually providing a way for us to make our democratic institutions work better. And we use their example and translate what we learn from our speakers to the Cook Leadership Academy. That's how it all fits together for us. That's what we're about at the Howenstein Center. Now this particular conference has been a joy because John Lauk, who's back there, and uh, John, stand up. Let's give you a hand. <laughs> John Lauk and I had a conversation up in Macosta, Michigan at the Russell Kirk Center about a year ago. And John was telling me all the exciting work that he's been doing in bringing together the scholars of the Midwest. The scholars of the Midwest have been sort of the forgotten stepchildren of history and literature. They've been overlooked because the Midwest has been overlooked as a region. We wanted to provide a stage for our great scholars of the Midwest to come together and show the creativity and the integrity and the probing questions with which they have attacked the questions in American history that redefine the, the Middle West and also bring the Middle West, the Midwest, back into the center of the American imagination. This is very important. John has a, an enormous Rolodex. He's eminently capable of bringing people together in this way. Uh, we've had over 30 speakers who have descended on Grand Rapids, Grand Valley to give us insights into what the Midwest is about and how it can redefine both history and literature and cultural studies and how we understand ourselves as a people. Terribly important work. So we're so proud to host the first Midwestern conference at Grand Valley through the Howenstein Center and the work of all of these great scholars. I wanna also say that, you know, with your support for this effort, we're going to build momentum through this. We're going to bring back John Lauk and all of this, this great cohort of speakers. And we have a very special speaker tonight who is going to be able to challenge us. Uh, Colin Woodard has done some great work. I'm not going to do the introduction. I'm going to have my colleague Joe Hogan come up and do that. But we're going to have, I think, a very, very stimulating conversation this evening through Colin Woodard's work on the 11 nations. I finally want to say that although I'm not a native of this area, I am so proud to live in Grand Rapids because as I've watched people come in from around the country and we've been able to share with them as they kind of get the wow factor, they, they, they've been asking, what is the X factor here in Grand Rapids? What makes West Michigan so special? Why is it that Lonely Planet said, you should come to West Michigan as a destination? It's one of the most interesting places on earth that has been overlooked. 2014, they said we were a number one destination. Lonely Planet did. Why are we the best beer city in the, the country? 
Why are we the number two foodie city? Why do workers in these surveys that Forbes magazine has conducted, why do workers and families consistently say that Grand Rapids in West Michigan is one of the greatest places in the United States to make your mark, to pursue happiness, that Jeffersonian dream of pursuing happiness? What is special about this place? And I've just found that it has been so special over the last day to talk about Grand Rapids, the fact that we're the second greatest rate of philanthropy in the United States, for example. There's so much to be proud of here. And it didn't hurt that the blossoms are on the trees, the bulbs are coming up. <laughs> it was a great day today, beautiful weather. So I thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing in what I think is a revolution in our perception of the Midwest. Thank you for all the ways that you support Ralph's dream and all the things that you do to make the Hauenstein Center possible, make it possible for us to put on these great programs. So thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to turn over the uh, stage to my good colleague, Joe Hogan, who's the program manager of our Common Ground Initiative. Thank you very much. Go get it, man. Thank you, Gleaves. This evening, we're pleased to invite back to Grand Rapids and the Howenstein Center an award-winning author and journalist. Colin Woodard is currently state and national affairs writer for the Portland Press Herald, Maine Sunday Telegram, where in 2012 he received a prestigious George Polk Award for his investigative reporting. He also writes for Washington Monthly, Politico Magazine, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and reviews books for the Washington Post. Woodard is a native of Maine, but we consider him an honorary Midwesterner. He certainly spent some time here, but then he spent some time everywhere, having reported from more than 50 foreign countries in seven continents, and lived for more than four years in Eastern Europe. His recent book, American Conversations, a History, or excuse me, American Nations, A History of the 11 Rival Regional Cultures of North America, was named one of the best books of 2011 by the editors of The New Republic and The Globalist, and won the 2012 Maine Literary Award for Nonfiction. In January 2014, we hosted him here at the Howenstein Center to discuss the book and each of the 11 rival regional cultures it examines. This evening, he's back to focus on the Midwest. Please join me in welcoming Colin Woodard. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you again to the Howenstein Center for having me back. It's a great pleasure. The Common Ground Initiative is something that's very close to my heart, and in fact, the next book I'm working on overlaps with a lot of the themes, so it's an honor to be back again. Thank you again, Mr. Howenstein, for coming tonight. And I was particularly thrilled to be invited to this conference because although I'm a Mainer, I have been following John Lauk's work in the Lost Region um, well before receiving the conference invitation, in part because I'm a regionalist and believe that regionalism is essential to our understanding of things, as you will shortly see, but also because as a Mainer, many of the themes that he is identifying in the Midwest and the, uh, the grievances that your region have uh, fall very close to home for Mainers. We're a society, although we're in New England, you were the western frontier, we were the eastern frontier, east of the great cities of the east coast that dominate the national conversation, and we never even got properly colonized. Half of our state is still empty without public roads or towns. Settlement failed in, the, uh, in competing actually with all of you and the railroads and with the uh, terrible climate in Maine, and we were absorbed by Massachusetts in the aftermath of the English Civil War and a hostile takeover that led to a long formal colonial period ending in 1820 that has fueled resentments in the sense of being on the periphery and not being, you know, being second rate and all of those things are infused into our culture. So I loved it, you know, reading that this guy, John Locke, out in South Dakota was championing the Midwest and many of the themes he touched on were close to my heart as well. So my compliments as well to John. So thank you again for having me out. I am here to present some of the national context in regionalism. If we're to understand the Midwest or anywhere else as a region, it's important to understand why regionalism is important in North America. So I'm gonna spend a bunch of the talk unpacking for you why I wrote American Nations and why regionalism is essential to understanding 
basically everything, you know, our history, our national identity, things that happen in politics in the past and today. And understanding the fissures in the actual regional map is essential. And it also, which I will get to in the second part of the talk, is important for understanding why it is that the Midwest has had a harder time um, in the ways that John identified, keeping that flywheel going. Why the culture in the Midwest compared to say, New England or the South has had a little harder time perpetuating itself leading to this effort to try to, to revive it. And it explains some of those things and I also hope will provide some interesting framing and context as you are thinking about how to define the Midwest and how to get around those problems. So uh, without further ado, um, now, I think everybody knows that regionalism is important on some level. After all, there's supposedly red states and blue and never the twain shall meet. There was a civil war and there's supposedly a place called the South that is still fighting it. Um, we know that presidential candidates, when they go out to run for president, are supposed to say one set of things to their party faithful in New Hampshire, and then two weeks later are supposed to say a completely different set of things to the faithful of the same party when they reach South Carolina. We know that even in this Tea Party era, a state like Maine and Mississippi might as well be on separate planets in terms of religious values, political priorities, ideas about the role of government, about the balance between church and state, and even the meaning of such key words in the American lexicon as freedom or liberty, or the definition of what American values are and what the American identity is. So what I argue in the book is that we're no more a united culture a united nation than Europe is. And indeed our component regional cultures are more diverse and share fewer values in common than the nation states the European Union do today. Even any two you might pick. But we're unable to have a conversation about these, a meaningful conversation, because we don't have the right map. Now everyone says, well of course we have regions, right? We have the Midwest and the Northeast and the South and the uh, Southwest and the West and so on. But these divisions, which follow state lines and come to us through the federal government, distort and dilute the true role of regional cultures because they miss many of the true fissures, which are historically based, have been consistent through the centuries, and rarely respect state or even international boundaries. Now again, we all know this, right? We know that state lines don't capture something important. We've been talking about it this morning. You know, anybody from Maryland knows that there are three Marylands, and they have a pretty good idea or argue with you exactly where the boundaries between those Marylands are. There's, uh, you know, people in Texas know that Austin is the capital, but that San Antonio and Houston and Dallas are the hubs of three very different Texases. There's the coastal strip there along the, uh, the coast, uh, in the, in, uh, on the coastal side of the range of mountains in the Pacific coast. Um, that is, uh, shares a great deal in common, whether you're in the northern part of California or in British Columbia or in Washington or Oregon, but completely differs with the interiors of their own states and provinces. There's upstate and downstate Illinois. And there's that great thing with uh, that, that piece of advice that the Democratic strategist James Carville gave to a political neophyte uh, about how to run for statewide politics in Pennsylvania. He said, you know, there's one thing you gotta know. There's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and Alabama in between. <laughs> and if he was talking about the highlands of uh, northern Alabama, he was in pretty strong ethno-historical grounds there. So, you even look at somewhere like Missouri, and on a regional basis, people can't even agree on how to pronounce the name of the state. So there's something missing with state boundaries. And yet, in times of uncertainty and discord, Americans tend to try to seek solace in the words of the Founding Fathers, hoping that if we return to their ideals, if we understood and followed their intent, we could find our misplaced sense of common purpose, restore the union to unity, and um, this effort is constantly failing. And it's failing for a very obvious fact, which is that the men who came together to form our country in 1775 and 1776, and to try to craft a more enduring alliance in 1787 to 1789 were not our country's founders, but rather the founders great and great great and great great grandchildren. And those founders, the ones in the 17th and early 18th century, shared very little in terms of common purpose, intent, and ideals. Indeed, most of our regional cultures date back to the 17th and early 18th centuries. 
You've seen this map this morning from, uh, from John. The original clusters of North American colonies were settled by people from distinct regions of the British Isles, or the Netherlands, or France, or Spain, each with their own religious, political, and ethnographic characteristics. For generations, these discrete Euro-American cultures developed in remarkable isolation from one another, consolidating their own cherished principles and fundamental values, and expanding across the eastern half of the continent in nearly exclusive settlement bands. That last slide brought you the range of European colonization up to 1776, then the shaded out part there is 1776, and this is how it proceeded there from 1850. Uh, now, some of these uh, regional cultures believed themselves guided by divine purpose. Others championed freedom of conscience and inquiry. Some embraced a specific and explicit Anglo-Protestant identity. Others believed in ethnic and religious pluralism. Some valued equality and democratic participation in politics. Others deference to an aristocratic traditional social order modeled on the slave states of classical antiquity. Throughout the colonial period in the early republic, they saw each other as competitors for land, for settlers, for capital, and even as enemies taking the opposite sides in conflicts like the English Civil War, the American Revolution, the War of 1812. Indeed, nearly all of these regional cultures that you see on this end of the map would consider leaving the Union in the 80 years following the surrender at Yorktown. And two, of course, went to war to do so in the 1860s. So the argument is that there's never been an America, but several Americas. And today, there are 11. There they are at the county resolution. Now I'm going to go through and introduce them very briefly. The book goes into the nuances and subtleties. I'm going to give you the cartoon version so that we can do this in a matter of minutes rather than hours. So bear with my shortcuts, but I want to present them quickly uh, and succinctly. And we'll start up in the uh, upper corner with the area marked Yankeedom in dark blue. This was founded on the shores of Massachusetts Bay by radical Calvinists as a new Zion, a light on the hill. And since the outset, it's placed a great emphasis on perfecting earthly society through social engineering, individual self-denial for the common good, what is more New England than that, and the aggressive assimilation of outsiders. It has prized education, intellectual achievement, and community rather than individual empowerment, and a broad citizen participation in politics and government, the latter seen as the public shields against the machinations of grasping aristocrats and other would-be tyrants. Now, what does this map depict? I think you all probably know, having been through many of the sessions this morning, but I'll just use Yankeedom as an example. Um, so, of course, the Puritans come, settle in Massachusetts Bay, absorb us Mainers, absorb the Plymouth Colony, and spread outwards. Uh, New York State, of course, New York, uh, the province of New York falls into U.S. hands after the Dutch defeat. And then in the aftermath of the revolution, there's an argument about sovereignty of much of upstate New York. So remember, each of the colonies, um, most of them had claims, east-west claims, the width of their colony going all the way to wherever the next ocean would be. And so Massachusetts said, we claim this whole swath of upstate New York. It's all ours. And New York State said, of course, no, we, this belongs to us. So there was a, a big fight about it, and a compromise was finally reached. And by the compromise, everyone said, you know, New York State gets sovereignty over this area. But by way of compensation, Massachusetts will receive title to the land over this six million acres of disputed land. And so Massachusetts then turned that over to Massachusetts-based settlement companies, who then brought, usually using entire extended communities led by their, by their cleric on into the, uh, into the upstate interior to found New England-style villages complete with their you know, meeting hall and their town green and so on and so forth in large swaths of upstate New York. See that dark blue part of Ohio there? That's, of course, the Western Reserve of Connecticut, because it was the same thing. Connecticut claimed the swath, and they said that part of uh, the uh, Northwest Territory and the future state of Ohio belongs to us. Same compromise. Connecticut-based land companies settled it with Connecticuters, which is why, if you look at your atlas, almost all of the towns you run into in the Western Reserve are named after towns in Connecticut, because that's where the people came from. Fast forward another generation when the Michigan Territory is being uh, settled, and you, this, the initial um, settlement and the initial territorial legislators and governors and people who uh, met for the Constitutional Convention and laid down the government norms and so on and so forth that would uh, send forth uh, Michigan's trajectory were all from the Western Reserve of Ohio, 
the Yankee settled upstate of New York, or New England itself. Five of the first six territorial and state governors of Michigan were Yankees, and four of them were born in New England. Same thing as you move uh, forward in time with Wisconsin, where nine of 12 um, were from New England or, or Yankees, and the rest of them were either New Netherlanders or foreign born. Even when you get out to Minnesota quite a bit later, a third of the first territorial legislature are New England born, better yet, adding in the Yankees and so forth. You had uh, you know, Yankee uh, missionaries. It was actually a missionary society devoted to carrying the New England way out into the wilderness of the West to save it from the wicked Kentuckians. And they built their own you know, um, in, you know, institutions, yeah, uh, New England style Congregational Presbyterian colleges. That's where we have uh, Grinnell and Case Western Reserve and Oberlin and, and uh, Ripon and Beloit and uh, Carleton and so on and so forth. So there was this Yankee cultural zone. You could tell a similar story about each of these regional cultures on the uh, right side of the map. So moving down into the area around the Big Apple, it's marked New Netherland, and indeed, that was established by not the English, but the Dutch, at a time when the Netherlands was the most sophisticated society in the Western world. And it has displayed the salient characteristics of Amsterdam in the, uh, in the early uh, 17th century throughout its history. It is a global commercial trading culture, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and materialistic, with a profound tolerance for diversity and an unflinching commitment to freedom of inquiry and conscience. Like 17th century Amsterdam, it's emerged as a leading global center of publishing, trade, and finance, a magnet for immigrants, and a refuge for those persecuted by, in the case of uh, Amsterdam, other kingdoms, and in the case of New Netherland, the other regional cultures, from the Sephardim in the 17th century to gays, feminists, and bohemians in the early 20th. Go a little further south, and this light blue, the Midlands culture, with its anchor around Delaware Bay, this is the Midlands, which is America's great swing region. And it was founded by English Quakers, you have Wilton Penn's uh, you know, experiment uh, on Delaware Bay, who believed in humans' inherent goodness and welcomed people of many nations and creeds to their utopian colonies. It was pluralistic, organized around the middle class, and spawned the culture of middle America and the heartland, where ethnic and ideological purity have never been a priority, where government is seen as an unwelcome intrusion, and where political opinion has generally been moderate, even apathetic. An ethnic mosaic from the start, Pennsylvania at the time of the revolution had a German rather than a British majority. It shares the Yankee belief that society should be organized to benefit ordinary people, but rejects the sort of top-down government public intervention that the Yan is the Yankee default position. And therefore, it's ended up being a swing region between two um, much more strongly polarized cultures on many terms on either side of it. Working our way down into the uh, Chesapeake country, uh, the eastern parts of North Carolina, the eastern shore, uh, southern counties in Maryland, the southern counties in Delaware, and so on, is the Tidewater. Now here's a region that was founded by the English, founded in roughly the same period as Yankeedom, but what a different set of English people. It wasn't built by you know, Calvinists trying to seek to create a utopia, a light on the hill for everyone to follow. It was uh, founded by the younger sons of Southern English gentry. And it was meant to reproduce the semi-feudal manorial society of the countryside that they'd left behind, where economic, political, and social affairs were run by and for landed aristocrats. They were sort of aiming for a early 17th century version of Downton Abbey. You know, they have responsibilities. <laughs> Finding it difficult, though, the, the big problem for this experiment is in the context of the American frontier was trying to find people willing to stand in for the role of the peasants. Nobody was volunteering. And so to make this model work, they turned first to indentured servants, and then, of course, tragically, as the 17th century came to an end, to a full-on slave system. But it didn't start out that way in Tidewater. Now, as you might imagine, Tidewater's always been fundamentally conservative. They were trying to bring an existing society and transplant it to the new world with a high value placed on respect for authority and tradition and very little on equality or public participation in politics. But it was the most powerful nation in the 18th century. But today, it's in decline, having been boxed out of westward expansion by its boisterous Appalachian neighbors, more on them in a minute, and more recently, eaten away by the expanding federal halos around the Federal District and the District of Columbia and the world's largest naval base at Norfolk and Hampton Roads. 
These are two places where the existence of the federal government and it's now trillions of dollars of spending mean that millions of people can live economic, social, and cultural lives without reference to the tidewater culture around them. And those two factors put together, you know, is there change on the map, I'm always asked. Well, of course there's change. Civilizations come and go, but it's a slow process. And if somebody was to ask me, what's, you know, a century from now, how would your map look different? I think the tidewater is, is sort of disappearing uh, slowly on the stage, although it's the thing that takes decades and centuries, not uh, one news cycle. Onto those boisterous Appalachian neighbors, that whole red area, which you can see expands far beyond the Appalachian range, as people have been discussing during the conference, including a large uh, tier of the southern part of what we usually consider the Midwest, but also carrying onwards uh, through the Ozarks and into uh, Oklahoma and, and the Texas Hill Country. Now, this is a region founded a little bit later, in the early 18th century, and it was founded by wave upon wave of settlers from the war-ravaged borderlands of Northern Ireland, the English Marches, and the Scottish Lowlands. Now, Appalachia has been lampooned by generations of writers and screenwriters ever since as the land of hillbillies and rednecks, but in reality, it's a transplanted culture from an area from formed in a state of near constant danger and upheaval and characterized by a warrior ethic and a deep commitment to personal sovereignty and individual liberty. It's a, and that has had a powerful effect on American democracy in the course of events after the revolution. Intensely suspicious of lowland aristocrats and the Yankee social engineers alike, Appalachia through our history has shifted alliances based on whomever seemed to be the greatest threat to their freedom at a particular time. Since reconstruction, it's been an alliance with the deep south in an effort to undo the federal government's ability to override local preferences. But not always the case. Consider this, during the Civil War, Greater Appalachia was essentially on the Union side. It's only with Reconstruction that that changes. Onwards to the uh, Deep South in dark red, lower down, with its hub at Charleston. Now this was, uh, we tend to think of the South as one place. It's of course not one place. It's three places, and you can argue whether or not Greater Appalachia is really the South or not. But even the Deep South and Tidewater have very different origins. The Tidewater was found, I mean, the Deep South was established by, uh, not by the, you know, younger sons of English gentry looking to set up uh, their, their estates because they'd been left out of the inheritance, but rather by slave lords from the English colony of Barbados. And it was set up just like Barbados, they were transplanting a fully formed West Indies style slave society right into the subtropical lowlands of the North American continent. Indeed, for, and, uh, I, I did a previous book on pirates dealing very intensely with the 1690s through the 1720s, you know, a time when Carolina was still young and in all of the references, it's known in that time period as Carolina in the West Indies. It's just treated as yet another one of the West Indies plantations um, by its own governors and others. Now, it's... Uh, ever since been a bastion of oligarchic privilege and a version of classical republicanism, republicanism modeled on the slave states of the ancient world. On ancient Greece and Rome, where democracy and democratic participation and self-government was the privilege of the few, and enslavement and subjugation considered the natural and the necessary lot of the many. Its slave and racial caste systems, of course, since been smashed with the help of outside intervention, but its leaders on the federal stage continue to fight against expansions of federal power, taxes targeting capital of the wealthy, and robust environmental, labor, and consumer safety regulations, which, as you might imagine, puts it in a collision course in almost everything with Yankeedom defining much of our uh, political life. You go down to the southern rim in the light blue in the uh, southwest, you have El Norte, which extends on uh, below into the northern tier of provinces in Mexico. Um, this is, in fact, if we're often taught traditionally, we were taught the manifest destiny east to west American history, but of course, if you're looking for the oldest Euro-American uh, culture, it's of course this one, and it came from the south northwards. This was the far-flung borderland region of Spain's vast empire in the New World, and so far and so remote from the seats of Spanish power in Mexico City and of course Madrid that it ended up evolving its own characteristics and institutions. You can see the map there, but this is essentially what it's tracing. You know, we, we know that Spain had a claim to much of the Western United States on paper, but this is the area that they effectively settled prior to the U.S. annexations, which with a couple small exceptions around San Francisco Bay and Eastern Texas, corresponds very much with the, uh, with the current map that I showed you. Now, most Americans are aware that this region is a place apart where Hispanic language and culture and societal norms dominate, 
but few realize that among Mexicans, Nortenos have a reputation for being more independent, self-sufficient, adaptable, and work-centered than their central and southern countrymen. In the Mexican historical context, this region has always been a, law, a hotbed of democratic reform and revolutionary sentiment, and that various parts of the region have even tried to secede and form buffer states to get away from what they consider the tyranny of Mexico City and to stay away from us in the, uh, in the um, emerging United States. There was the Republic of the Rio Grande. There was the Republic of Texas. That wasn't just Austin and his Anglo followers. They were backed by the entire Spanish-speaking elite of that province of Mexico. So the hope was to be a third place in between. Of course, it didn't happen that way, but that was the plan, a buffer state between the two federations. Today, it stretches for about 100 miles uh, on either side of the border um, and resembles in many ways Germany during the Cold War, one culture separated by a large wall. Now, the next two I'm gonna mention are a little bit different. These are second generation nations, I call them, because all we've been talking about so far are how various European uh, colonial projects came and spread across the landscape, uh, you know, pushing away the inhabitants who were already there. Here, we're talking not about a, another you know, European transplant, but we're talking about two much newer nations that were founded by the rest of the cultures. And chronologically speaking, the first one that was settled was actually the left coast, not the interior. This Chile-shaped nation I mentioned before, wedged between the Pacific Ocean and the Cascade and coastal mountain ranges, it was originally colonized essentially by two groups. There were merchants, missionaries, and woodsmen from New England who arrived by sea and tended to dominate the towns. Why did they arrive by sea? Because crossing the far west was so incredibly dangerous and treacherous and difficult and took so long that in the you know, 1840s and 1850s and 1860s, until the railway was finished, the, the, if you had the money, the cheapest, most comfortable and safest and fastest way to get there was to get on a ship in Boston and go all the way around, even without the Panama Canal, go all the way around, go through the Drake Pal Passage with the world's greatest circumpolar storms and the 60-foot seas and come all the way up the coast of South America. That was the easy route for those with means. And so Yankees came and once again, they were coming with their missionaries. They were going to save California uh, for, to create another Massachusetts and another light on the hill that would beckon out to everybody in Asia and a new utopia would be built. However, it didn't happen that way because there was a second stream of people who was also coming at the same time who was very different. And those were prospectors and miners and fur traders and farmers, most of them from the Appalachian sections of the Midwest who generally arrived the hard way by wagon overland across the perilous far west and who ended up settling and dominating the countryside. And this meant that despite considerable effort, the Yankee uh, you know, missionary and colonial project was not entirely successful. They did not create a new New England on the Pacific, as they put it. The left coast is instead a hybrid culture of those two things, and rather a fascinating one, because it combines the Yankee optimism and utopianism, the idea that we can, you know, we can and should recreate a more perfect and godly society on Earth now, California dream, with the Appalachian emphasis on individual self-expression and exploration and actualization. And it's ended up being a rather fecund one because think, you know, this area has a population of about 21 million. So it's, you know, not as even as large as Poland, about the size of Romania. And yet, think of all the company, companies that now dominate 21st century global life. They're all based there. You know, Apple and Facebook and Google and Twitter and Microsoft and Amazon, they're all in that little tiny strip and it's no accident. Politically, however, it has been the staunchest and most reliable ally of Yankeedom throughout history, uh, starting from its foundations in the 1850s and onwards. And the other uh, of these second generation nations, and the last one settled, is the vastness of the Far West. Now this is the one area of the country that I will concede and admit that environmental factors absolutely trumped all these ethnographic ones. Because in the late 19th century, when this place was settled, it was high and dry and remote, and it just stopped all of the Eastern nations and their folkways and agricultural methods in their tracks. And with minor exceptions, or the not so minor exception of the Mormons, was only colonized through the deployment of vast industrial resources from the outside, usually preceding settlement rather than following it, Railroads, 
heavy smelters, mining equipment, dams, vast irrigation systems. And as a result, settlement was largely directed and controlled by large corporations headquartered in distant New York and Boston and Chicago and San Francisco or by the federal government itself, which controlled much of the land. And as a result, it was then through intentional policies exploited by the rest of us as an internal resource colony to the benefit of the seaboard nations through the, you know, the tweaking of railroad rates to ensure that they would never industrialize by, by what, would be a, what you would charge to send things through the region as compared to sending manufacturers out and so on and so forth. And the resentment has stuck. They, uh, the Far Westerners have long and always been aware of this dependent status and have oscillated through history in targeting their resentment against their two tormentors. There was that whole populist phase of the big populist senators in uh, post-World War II who were taking on you know, Anaconda Copper and uh, the Union Pacific Railway and the Hearst Corporation, or in the current guise, taking the tormentors of the federal government, which has, uh, currently has the Far West in a sort of alliance with the Deep Southern Bloc rather than the Yankee Bloc in its current thing. But it's a weak partner because the real problem is the tormentors and there's two of them. Now, uh, briefly, there's two other uh, nations that make up North America. This book is uh, uh, actually about North America writ large, not just the US. Both of these only have small enclaves within the United States, but briefly, there is New France, uh, which includes the enclave uh, in Louisiana, um, which blends the folkways of Ancien Regime, Northern French peasantry with the traditions and values of the Aboriginal people they encountered in the St. Lawrence Valley and the shores of the Northumberland Strait back in Champlain's era. And it's an interesting place. It's down to earth, egalitarian and consensus driven. It's been shown in Quebec. Pollsters have shown uh, Quebec in the uh, Acadian regions of the French Shore, New Brunswick, and so on to be among the most liberal people in the continent in terms of tolerating differences and the like. Not so much if English should be spoken in Montreal, but within, the, within their own community. And uh, that's fascinating because think about it. It was the, the, the colonization took place during the era of uh, Louis XIV, right? The guy who built Versailles. This was supposed to be another feudal project, but it failed in the context of uh, North America because many of the uh, peasants from Normandy and Brittany and elsewhere in northern France who came here from the Bay of Biscay, who came to uh, Quebec, quickly discovered they had a great deal more in common culturally and socially and in practices and stuff with the aboriginal inhabitants they were encountering with these strange lordly cr class who, uh, who uh, they were supposed to be obeying. And many of them just abandoned the fiefs and ran off with Indians and learned uh, snowshoeing and raised uh, Métis families. And the, this left many of the, um, of the seigneurs, the, the, the feudal lords who were supposed to be uh, governing the St. Lawrence Valley, sending all these desperate letters back, which you can read now in the archives that say things like, you know, Peasants have run away. You know, I'm very hungry. I don't know how to use a hoe. You know, please, <laughs> please send food. You know, so it, it was a very different society than it was supposed to be, and uh, deviated radically from France itself. Um, and then the last one uh, is marked First Nation there. Um, if the map extended further, you'd see how large it really is. This is not my map, but a uh, fan blogger out there did it, and it's pretty accurate. But you can see uh, covers a vast expanse of the far north of our continent. And this is either the newest or the oldest of the nations, depending on how you want to look at it, because it's populated by Native American groups and tribes, many Inu and Inuit speaking, who generally never gave up their land by trick or treaty or anything else to the rest of us. Because everyone said in the 19th century, oh, it's not worth the bother, up. there's nothing up there but snow. Nobody bothered to try to take it because it was considered to not be worth the effort of taking. And these groups and tribes have more recently in the past 20 years started pointing this out. It also includes, uh, he, he left off Greenland, which is also part of North America, which is part of the same cultural space. And in both the Kingdom of Denmark and in Canada, they've been winning significant constitutional court decisions. And people are saying, you're right. Can Canadian court said, oh yeah, you know, it turns out you never did give that up, so I guess it still kind of belongs to you. And so suddenly in that vast region, um, the native tribes have a seat at the table and essential veto power over all kinds of major decisions involving resource extraction and such. And guess what? There's plenty of stuff there. In fact, that's the storehouse for North America of all the stuff that this continent in the world will possibly want from water to rare earths to strange minerals to uh, 
oil and natural gas, it's the storehouse. So it'll be quite fascinating because it's quite a different culture. These are people who've uh, lived far enough north, they've generally, and to a surprising degree, retained many of the cultural practices that allowed them to live in this incredibly extreme uh, environment. And uh, they retained a lot of that knowledge to survive in that region on their own terms. Um, and now that they've won a lot of their autonomy, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Greenland stands, see they have full autonomy in Denmark and stand on the verge of being a separate nation state. It will be the first uh, you know, native North American speaking uh, nation state on the globe. They're 97% Inuit, they still retain their language when you go up there. Interestingly, it's, uh, you know, there's, as you might imagine, there's collective property ownership, nobody owns anything. There aren't any roads between towns even, that's how remote uh, Greenland is, it's, the mountains are too powerful to, uh, to, uh, to try to build a road through, and the towns are so small anyway. And it's a place where women had never been inferior in their culture. They were always in equal standing. And as the uh, scourges of alcohol abuse and drugs fell upon the men much more, uh, much harder, it, you go to Greenland and women are in control of everything. You know, the mayors and the, the Lutheran bishop of Greenland and the foreign minister and the prime minister and so on and so forth. In fact, the foreign minister told me there's one thing you have to understand about us. It's in the 18th century when the Danes came, came to us to colonize us, they said, we have a God and he looks like us and we want you to worship him. And we looked at each other and we said, he? And so it's a very different take on things. <laughs> the foreign minister, by the way, is now the prime minister of the country. So those are the 11 nations. And as I mentioned, their effect on history has been profound. This map you see here was echoed in the... Um, maps of the battle lines of the English Civil War and the American Revolution, in the debates at the Constitutional Convention over our salient and key issues, in the key votes leading up to the U.S. Civil War, and in the presidential maps of almost any hotly contested election in our history. And hey, let's do a little bit with that. You have to look, you can't look at a red state, blue state map, you have to look at a red county, blue county map to understand these things, right? And you can see it, everything's popping out there. Uh, as, I, as I had pointed out, you got you got the Yankee zone there, Western Reserve of Ohio coming up through much of the upper Midwest. You can see the left coast popping out there in one color. And no, I did not tweak the colors. The red really is Republican and the blue really is Democrat because this is not a recent election. This is the 1916 showdown between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Hughes. <laughs> there you go, that's, uh, that's Barack Obama versus McCain in 2008. You can see a very similar pattern. The only differences, the key differences, well, there's two of them. One is the parties have reversed polarity after the Southern strategy and switched constituencies. Parties come and go, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and the Whigs are gone, the Republicans and Democrats have switched chairs, but the fissures remain constant. When things get really contentious, it always breaks on those lines. Not all maps will look like that. There are maps that are all one color or the other. You know, FDR's re-election and Ronald Reagan and even Richard Nixon's uh, re-election uh, in 72, you'll see all one color. But when there are differences, they break on this pattern. And the other, dif the other difference from the 1916 map is, hey look, the, uh, the areas of the deep south and tidewater are no longer a single color. And same with uh, El Norte is starting to appear there. That's because, of course, the difference between 1916 and 2008 is that African American and Hispanic Americans were able to exercise the franchise, and we're seeing that reflected in majority black counties and in the, uh, the actual demographics of El Norte. It's one of my favorite maps. This uh, ran after the 2008 election in all sorts of places, the New York Times and elsewhere. This map basically asks, between 2004, you know, John Kerry versus George W. Bush, and the 2008 election of Barack Obama versus McCain, did a given county on the map vote more Democratic in 2008 or more Republican? And the answer, no surprise of the hope change uh, election, was that uh, much of the country voted more for uh, Obama than they had for Kerry, except for this large red, mysteriously greater Appalachian-shaped uh, space on the map which was quite the opposite. Indeed, throughout his career, Barack Obama has had a greater Appalachian problem, and he knows it. He did quite terribly, even in the 2012 election in the Democratic primaries in Greater Appalachia. He had a surprising difficulty against unknown challengers in the primaries in his own party. In West Virginia, in 2012, 41% of voters cast ballots in the Democratic primary for a Texas prison inmate over the sitting incumbent president of their party. 
In Kentucky, 42% of Democrats preferred uncommitted to the sitting incumbent president of their own party. In Arkansas, Obama won the uh, primary 58 to 41 over an attorney from Tennessee. But remember, Arkansas is divided diagonally between the Deep South and Greater Appalachia. He lost that state's Appalachian counties by 30 to 50 percentage points per county. The sitting president. So you think, what, what's going on with that? You know, Barack Obama was born in Hawaii, so he's an outlander, but he spent his whole uh, adult academic and political career in Yankeedom between the University of Chicago and Harvard, and he basically ran as a Yankee candidate, and Yankee candidates do really badly in greater Appalachia. So Eureka, you can imagine, I have this book out about re American regionalism, and everyone wants to know what it means as we're moving into the, 20, uh, the 2012 elections. And uh, this sounds like the answer, right? There's a greater Appalachia problem. That would have solved it. So what happened? Well, the Republicans nominated a Yankee candidate themselves. They nominated Mitt Romney, who was the you know, governor of Yankee, uh, uh, Massachusetts, and the son of the Yankee governor of Michigan, and even belonged to a much commented religion that has Yankee origins during the Second Great Awakening that shares with the Puritans the idea that we should try to recreate a more perfect and godly world now. Here, let's go do it together. All of those things played terribly in Greater Appalachia. So they washed each other out. They both had the same regional strengths and differences uh, because both parties ended up nominating people from um, the same regional culture. However, in the Republican primaries, you got to see this played out very nicely. In the Republican primaries, you had Romney, the candidate of Yankeedom against Rick Santorum, the candidate of Greater Appalachian, later Newt Gingrich from the Deep South, and gosh, you would see it. The green shades are the uh, counties that uh, Romney won. The deeper green, the more he won by. The browns are Rick Santorum. And as you can see, the only reason that Romney carried Ohio and uh, continued the momentum on towards the Republican nomination is the Western Reserve. There are these ones around these uh, suburban counties around Cincinnati, though. And when I was giving a talk out there, I asked my Republican host about that. I said, why, why did everyone go for him? We were voting strategically. We had to get rid of him. So I don't know if that's true or not, but the Western Reserve carried the state for Romney. Romney, by the way, also completely swept New England's uh, Republican primaries and the uh, left coast districts. You can also see uh, in Illinois a uh, very similar pattern against Santorum. And then everything was supposed to change. If you remember back to 2012, all the pollsters were saying, well, now we're getting to Alabama and Mississippi, and this is going to be when Newt Gingrich is going to break out, and it's going to suddenly become a three-way race, and these races are too close to call, and some of us see Gingrich winning. Completely wrong. Santorum ran away with it. Blue is the Gingrich votes. He ran, he won Alabama by a lot. And the reason is that Santorum took the Appalachian part of Alabama by huge margins, winning by 30 and 40 and 50 points. And the pollsters didn't weigh their polls. They weighed them using the classic metrics of you know, gender and income and so on and so forth, but not regional cultures to the detriment of the accuracy of their polls. Mississippi was closer primarily because uh, the Appalachian section in Mississippi is a smaller overall proportion of the vote. But otherwise, pretty much Santorum and Gingrich were duking it out, Romney winning uh, certain uh, key counties uh, uh, in, the, in the Yazoo Valley. And this uh, is the most recent presidential election just to show you the continuation of the patterns that it continues on holding. So uh, today, the brinksmanship we face today is that um, the way, if you overlay demographics and population and the Electoral College and the, uh, the House districts and the Senate districts over this map, you run into an interesting phenomenon of late. We have two, we've, there's always been sort of two superpower blocks through our history and our politics. One is the Deep South and whatever coalition partners it's built at a particular time, and the other is Yankeedom and whatever coalition partners it's built at a particular time. And those partners have shifted around a bit, although Yankeedom has been able to rely on the left coast for a long time. The current blocks are the blue block, which is Yankeedom, the left coast, and New Netherland, against a red block, which is currently the Deep South, Greater Appalachia, and the Far West. And, get, and the other um, nations are unsure. They swing back and forth. They're ambivalent. They're not sold on either political formation's uh, ideas. So we live on a knife's edge because neither of these solid blocks control anywhere near the level of political heft to control the levers of federal power in Washington. 
they can't get a filibuster-proof Senate majority in a, the White House and the uh, majority in the House, neither of them. So we live in a finicky time with control shifting back and forth, and our institutions, which of course rely, as they were built to rely on compromise and to play sections off each other, are now paralyzed to the peril of the Republic. In the past, what's happened, one coalition or the other, and it used to not be sorted by parties, right? They were, they were transsectional. You'd have breakoffs. One party would have one wing, and they'd ally with the other wing. But through those coalitions, those regional coalitions, throughout history, there have been supermajorities that have governed for decades at a time and had stable periods in our politics where things happened. One or the other of the political formations is going to have to change their um, fundamental project enough to win over some of the swing nations or the weak coalition partners of the other, and that's how the deadlock will eventually end. Now, zooming in and more to the topic uh, at hand here at this conference, zooming into the Midwest, um, as you know, as you've seen by now, one of the implications of all this is that there, the Midwest, and what we think of as the Midwest, has these three competing cultural streams that you kept seeing in presentation after presentation in different contexts uh, in this conference. Um, they come from the east, and when you hit the Great Plains, there's a fourth one, and that that environmental determinism of the inability of these cultures to project onwards mean you have another regional culture there. So four of them, really, and three cultural streams, each with a heritage that extends back eastward. Now, um, in American nation's terms, in the terms of Wilbur Zielinski's doctrine of first effective settlement upon which this artifice is built, there is no single coherent regional culture we can call the Midwest which is part of the reason we're all here, because Midwestern regional identity has been more ambiguous and less resilient than New England or the South, because in addition to other factors, it doesn't have that powerful flywheel of having that common settler culture roots and symbols and stuff to draw back on. It's trifurcated, which has hobbled the effort, which is why there's been that, that uh, difficulty and problem. Now, that same, you could say the same thing, you know, that, that you gotta, you got uh, those splits if you talk about the other U.S. census divisions. If you talk about the Southwest and the East and the West, it's the same problem. But the real South doesn't follow those definitions. There's something else at work. So that's part of the issue at hand. Now, these divisions slice across the region that we call the Midwest, uh, and you can map it in a broad range of important cultural phenomenon. We've seen this map earlier today. Um, this would be... Um, uh, uh, the mapping of uh, the diffusion of culture via building styles and building techniques uh, through Fred Kniffen and Henry Glassy uh, back in 1966 from their uh, colonial nuclei. You see it, uh, here's a map from the, uh, Amer the uh, Atlas of uh, American Historical Geography. This is uh, showing you where all the congregational churches were in 1860. Each dot represents at least you know, five or less churches. That's the old Puritan church's essential descendant. It's a marker for Yankeedom. As you can see in 1860, it pretty much follows the contours of my Yankeedom. And you then fast forward, you know, almost two centuries to, you know, the late 20th century, and here's Wilbur Zielinski mapping out religious regions of the United States using different criteria. And again, you see all this time after settlement, you still see these big east-west sweeps across the region in the fundamental, um, you know, religious uh, categorizations. Here is a map of today's dialects at super detail in the Midwest. This is somebody who's in the internet, when you click those, those little dots, you will hear a recording of people speaking in that location. It's been put together by, a, uh, by an incredible enthusiast, uh, uh, Rick Ashman, uh, who's gone throughout the country building this uh, for the past 15 or 20 years. But look, this, came, this map came out after I wrote the book. You essentially have in the broad domain areas those same three or four with the Great Plains, broad dialectical regions, a north, a midland, thank you for the name, and even a inland south coming up against uh, the western dialect. So in, even down to the way people talk, you have these fundamental divisions, which is incredibly frustrating to anybody trying to work out Midwestern geography, whether you're working at the regional level or in state. Look at this poor blogger trying in Illinois trying to work out Illinois' divisions. They got so frustrated by the third slide, they went with Chicago and corn and green. <laughs> and poor John, I mean, what's up with this East River, West River thing, right? One, it's a pretty small state, but there's this constant battle over the allegiances between what is essentially the uh, far western region and its Midland and Yankee ones. And then into pop culture, you know, you even got major league baseball teams. Here's Ohio. 
Now this, uh, you saw this map, I think John put it up. This is uh, uh, data pulled from Facebook based on likes, onto like pages down to the zip code level, and the sample size is massive. You know, it's like every human being has weighed in on this one. And this is what it looks like. And my first reaction whenever anyone shows me these sports maps of fandoms, I'm always like, yeah, it's Nielsen television markets, right? That's what they could, th that's the team they could see when they turned on the TV. Except when I look at the Nielsen markets, Ohio has nine Nielsen television markets. So it's not just Cleveland and Cincinnati's markets. You know, Columbus and Toledo and Dayton and Youngstown all have their own ones, so that's not at work. And there you got the poor Cleveland Indians pushed up into the Western Reserve and unable to make any roads into the Appalachian sections. The Midlands are sometimes up for grabs. Deep stuff. So going back to, we have all of those complications. That's what you're up against. Um, but uh, what is the Midwest then? Because there is a Midwest, right? I mean, I, and when I talk about analyzing politics, which I'm often asked to do in current political events, I argue that there isn't a Midwest for those purposes because the differences between these sections are so profound. But of course, there is a Midwest. There's a shared perspective you've been talking about and a continuity, but I would argue that that is the product of three separate cultures sharing a common historical and geographical experience and common externally imposed political framework. That's the shared experience of having all of them try settling the interior in the shadow of a coastal elite, um, being looked down upon as we are in Maine from Beacon Hill and from the boardrooms of New York and Philadelphia, and for many parts of the Midwest, all those grievances that you have of a periphery against the metropolis. Though, you know, I caution you can make too much of this because as I said, in Maine, this region, the old Northwest, was the promised land for us through which our beleaguered population after the Civil War when the economy completely collapsed and the railroad started connecting your fertile, thick, graniteless topsoil with our farmers' markets in the uh, eastern seaboard. The entire uh, farming economy of Maine collapsed and people fled en masse in huge numbers to Ohio and Michigan and elsewhere. It was called the Ohio fever. The state just emptied out because not only was this the promised land of a, a better chance economically, it was also a chance to integrate with national markets because the railroads weren't coming our way. We're the eastern frontier. We're not on the way to anything. Nobody knows what New Brunswick is, right? They think it's where Rutgers is, so nobody's gonna build a railway in our direction. So you can, over, you can overplay that, but um, it is indeed uh, um, a common experience that was held in the Northwest Territories. And I think it started with the Northwest uh, Ordinances, um, which prohibited slavery, amongst other things, in this sprawling uh, US territory. And that itself, on the Appalachian Stream, which straddles what you consider the Midwest and other regions of the country, um, it, it set very different social and cultural and economic conditions uh, within the Northwest Territory than south of it, creating that difference that you know, was observed by uh, Tocqueville and many others in the Ohio River and elsewhere. It also, the fact of uh, slavery being prohibited, um, created a firewall against the expansion of the Deep South up the Mississippi River anywhere beyond uh, Missouri. And it also ensured that Tidewater's little abortive enclave in the bluegrass country of Kentucky was never able to get a toehold and expand. So it continued a number of decades later with what we in Maine, but I've noticed nobody else in the world calls the Maine-Missouri Compromise, uh, which created our state and finally liberated us from the tyrants of Massachusetts. Um, and that, uh, of course, uh, uh, made uh, the rest of what we consider the Midwest also uh, a free area except for Missouri. But then again, Missouri has always been divided, right? Nobody thinks the Ozarks are in the Midwest. St. Louis is, tellingly, but not the Ozarks. So you have those, uh, you have those deep, um, th those, those, commonalities in that glue of that historical experience and some of these broader um, institutional framework that does give a common experience uh, to the Midwest, which you all know, but I'm pointing it out that those are the characteristics of it that glue it together despite the separate cultural streams. So I think maybe the solution just conceptually while you're thinking about both the definition of the Midwest and how to revive it is to be merging those two concepts uh, like this blogger has done here recently. He created the five Midwest. This is from a guy named Peter Saunders, Detroit born, Muncie raised, an ermid planner in Chicago. Uh, he's added a North Woods to my map and his map's a little bit different than mine. But you know, he's pointing in that direction of a federated Midwest. 
yes, that something resembling this area does have something in common and is the Midwest, but it has major federated attributes between the areas. And I think that that's a, probably a very useful way of looking at it as you all go forward conceptually in rebuilding the Midwest because by acknowledging that Achilles heel, it allows you to build on, on the strengths and separate the divisions from the commonalities. So um, that's where I will leave it for now and open it up for questions. Excellent. Thanks, Colin. Uh, outstanding presentation. I really don't agree with your, I don't disagree with your map at all. I think, uh, I think you're spot on. I think you've identified a lot of important political patterns here. Um, basically, if the Republicans have a uh, chance of winning in 2016, they need to find a Quaker from central Ohio. <laughs> um, and then that's her ideal candidate. You know, this actually might explain a lot of, uh, some of us are still mystified how Nixon won two national elections. Well, you know, Nixon was a Quaker. Quaker yeah. Those central <laughs> counties in Ohio, this might explain a lot, um, which no one has really ever identified before. But I have a couple questions for you. Um, and uh, the first one is, if I were to go to an academic conference, say the Organization of American Historians or whatever, and talk about your map, yeah. again, I don't disagree with the ethno-cultural uh, breakdown of your map, but the first thing I would be accused of doing at an academic conference is essentializing. Oh, my Lord, I can't believe you're essentializing these cultural patterns. Uh, this, this makes no sense. These are all free will moral actors. They don't make decisions based on what happened in 1850. How do you respond to something like that? Well, I mean, two things. First of all, when people say, well, this doesn't explain absolutely everything. Well, of course it doesn't. You know, human life is extremely complex. This is just one aspect of it. You know, you would be foolish not to also be looking, if you care about, say, politics, at the differences between urban and rural voters and, uh, and uh, differences in different enclaves and immigrants from this place and so on and so forth. All of it matters. But if you had to pick one single thread and you, you were forced to pick just one, this is the one that's going to tell you the most. So, you know, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's exclusive um, in that respect. In regards, though, to the idea that, you know, these, these regions, these nations don't have a consciousness themselves and therefore can't be actors or don't have influence, I don't know how you would express it in academic terms, but I think they're incorrect about that in that human societies, the way that they're built, there are cultural norms and expectations and institutions and symbols and shared stories that we humans seem to be geared and hardwired to rally around as we, right, because we, we humans, we're the only advanced social species that both is facing individual selection and group selection. All the other advanced social species are, you know, termites and bees and ants and so on that are, are operating as a super organism. The individual doesn't matter. There's an extension of the queen's genome and the hives are competing against one another. We're not like that. Not only are we individuals competing, we're also cooperating. We're, we're, we're forming bands and we're cooperating so that our band beats out the other band, right? A selfish individual will beat out an altruistic individual, but an altruist, a band of altruists will beat out a band of selfish people. And that's been the theme throughout our history and is, you know, run through E.O. Wilson and evolutionary biology and so on and so forth. And those, because we do that, because we form groups and we build these institutions, the group formation is very much a part of how we as individuals are um, socialized and brought up. Now, we may not agree with it. I mean, I'm not saying that somebody from Yankeedom holds all the Yankee values. I'm saying that those Yankee values are this sort of fact in the air and the ethos in Yankeedom that you have to confront. You may hate it. You know, every single one of these counties is gonna have the full range of individual opinion on everything. Even in the most, um, the bluest of blue counties and the reddest of red counties on a map, you know, there's 30% of the uh, voting electorate who's voting for the wrong side, right? So there's enormous diversity of opinion. It's just where is the dominant 
value structure that you're confronting, where is it pointing? And so that, which is transmitted through generations and is sort of this shared social construct and creation that we receive in all sorts of ways, in the family, in schools, in literature, whatever it is, and has been around since we were setting up around the first campfires, yeah, it has an effect, absolutely. And I don't know, you know, I'm not from the academic background, I have all the language to throw at them, but I'm sure if you called up a couple people and read some papers on all that stuff from the evolutionary biologists and so on and so forth, you'd, you'd have the, arc, the stuff to beat back that at the OAH meeting. I heard John uh, Butler say this afternoon or describe how he just recently moved from Connecticut out to Minnesota and how they are two different worlds, and he went into detail about this. And I have sort of a story about this. Uh, I've worked on a number of elections in South Dakota, and I've always thought it would be a fun comparative study to look at elections in South Dakota versus South Carolina, because I've been down there for a couple of, uh, yeah. for a couple of campaigns, for campaign stops, and uh, it is a different world. South Carolina, South Dakota, they only share that first prefix. <laughs> And, uh, you know, South, South Dakota, basically, if you're a political candidate, you are punished for being mean or being perceived as mean. Right. But in South Carolina, it's sort of in the water that you're considered sort of a weakling if you don't go at the jugular of your candidate. Anyway, the political cultures are vastly different in my experience. One question I have about this map um, is that in the 19th century, no one can question the power and the presence of the greater Yankee Empire as it moved west. What I have a question about, though, and what doesn't make any sense to me, is the very rapid collapse of Yankeedom. It just doesn't seem to have as much power as it used to have. The collapse of the congregational churches and the old Puritan culture. Where did it go, and why did it fall apart so quick? Well, it sort of fell into secular Puritanism, right? Because the the Puritan idea carried in it the seeds of its own destruction. Once, it, once you had all of the individuals worrying about their salvation because of you know, um, predeterminism, you didn't know whether you wanted the chosen or not, and it encouraged this sort of thinking and worrying about it personally, and that the mantle of worrying about these big existential issues fell on you. And once the Puritans started pushing out from New England away from their nucleated communities and the speed and technology of transportation and stuff made the frontier move faster and faster. The, the communities didn't have the same reinforcing cohesion and individuals were more out there with their thoughts which quickly led to congregationalism starting to break up into Unitarianism. And also the Second Great Awakening comes and you have this whole flowering, just, you know, down in Greater Appalachia you had this flowering, you know, the, 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 the big meeting there at Cane Ridge and, uh, and so on. There was the same stuff going on in Yankeedom, except it wasn't this um, personal uh, you know, encounter with the divine and you had this sort of in, like Scots-Irish individual relationship with the maker. In the Second Great Awakening in Yankeedom was playing out with all of these free electrons because people would, would, would break out and create a new utopian religion. You know, you had the Millerites and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Mormons and the Christian scientists, and they all shared, though, that same sort of utopian shared project together, rebuilding the, this world isn't corrupt, we're going to make this world godly. So all those things, that, that's, that was all a Puritan heritage, you know. The, the Mormon experience is a sort of a Puritan heritage, even though Puritanism is gone. Even the sort of, um, you know, New England, if you go to the Pew surveys on religion, a lot of the most apathetic religiously places are in New England and in parts of Yankeedom. And part of that is because it's gone sort of full circle and many of those things are now sort of internalized into the sort of secular culture even as the religious stuff has sort of fallen away. But the Puritan characteristics are still there. So I think it, I think it has to do with the particularities of of Puritanism and Calvinism as it actually played out in a frontier setting over time. But it's still, there's still something there from it. Let me ask one last question since we're in Michigan today. Um, Michigan used to be the heartland of the old congregational Puritan Yankee tradition, very strongly mm -hmm. Republican state up until I suppose the 1930s. And then for many years, the power of Detroit and the labor unions and the power of labor and the Upper Peninsula made it a democratic state. But for the last couple of cycles or so, Republicans have thought of 
Michigan as the state that's possible to win. It's sort of the Lucy and the football right. state. And so at the end of the campaign, you often will see a presidential candidate make a try for Michigan because right. of the, the decline of Detroit, the reddening of the Upper Peninsula, and other demographic changes they see going on in Detroit or in uh, Michigan. Do you have any thoughts on this and your patterns and what might happen with Michigan? Yeah. Well, it's a really, it's a really interesting, and I find Michigan a fascinating state to watch for that reason. Wisconsin, to a certain extent, as well, but Michigan, especially, you know, given that long labor history and manufacturing and what will happen, um, the the paradigm says that, you know, in the end, these cultures win out, right? That you'll have immigrants from the deep south or any other country in the world will come here and they will bring their culture and, and contribute and that's great and, and retain their cultures even and have enclaves that last but over time you know their grandchildren if they stay in that region will have us picked up the you know have, will have assimilated not into America but into one of these regional cultures right down to the dialect of English they're speaking that's the argument and the argument would be that over time the cultural ethos, you know, you'll see blips in the data from time to time, but overall, over time, the cultural ethos of the region will kind of win out in the broader data. And therefore, we would predict that Michigan would not um, start voting radically different than Minnesota and, uh, you know, New England uh, over the long period. They might be voting for different parties, but I'm saying that the entire block might be voting for a different party as well. Now, whether that happens or not, um, We'll have to see. I don't know as much about Michigan politics as you Michiganers, but I'm certainly interested in learning more about it and watching what happens and seeing whether or not the, the paradigm triumphs. One last question I just thought of, uh, and then I'm going to give up this mic, <laughs> yeah. but Gleaves told me to take the mic. So uh, <coughs> basically, American politics, presidential politics in 2016, it's going to come down to the Midwest. It's going to come down to who wins Iowa, who wins Wisconsin, who wins Ohio, because the rest of these regions are sort of set. The West is going to be Republican, the South is going to be Republican, Northeast will be Democrat, West Coast will be Democrat. Far West is a little soft, but yeah. Yeah. So the question is, if it comes down to Hillary Clinton from, from Illinois, which she will play up even though she's, she's been gone Cubs a while. Cap, I noticed, yeah. yes. <laughs> and let's say it's... I'm a uh, Quaker! No. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say it's Governor Walker of Wisconsin. How does that sort itself out using your pattern here? Well, in theory, Walker, the, the regional, or to the extent that Walker and Clinton both uh, tried to play the role of, say, being a Yankee or a Midlander. I don't know, would Clinton be playing a Yankee from Chicago, I assume? Not a Midlander from Chicago. Uh, Cook County is uh, shared between the Midlands and uh, Yankeedom, and the uh, city of New Orleans is shared between Deep South and uh, and New France, those are the only two that are bifurcated. So I'm not sure which side, which side she's on. Normally, if you had two candidates from the same region who were running from the tradition of their region, they would cancel each other out as Romney and Obama did. You had a Yankee conservative with a familiar Yankee conservative platform and a Yankee liberal from a fairly familiar Yankee liberal platform and they had the same regional strengths and, and differences. Is Walker gonna run as a Yankee? I don't think so, so that, they no longer become proxies for my nations because I don't think either of them is going to be emblematic of their particular regional culture, at least in the way they run. I would assume that Walker is going to run, um, well, he'd probably play very well in Appalachia. I assume he's going to run more on a sort of individual liberty, um, sort of libertarian platform, which isn't part of the grand Yankee ethos, and that's fine. He can do it and maybe do it successfully, but I just don't think it gives us a proxy for the nations. Oh, oh, okay, well, what have I missed? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that those particular candidate pairs are going to give us any data to work with. I'm trying to think of candidate pairs that do, though. Um, I mean, Bernie Sanders, in a sense, is closer. I mean, he's, a, he's pretty far into the, into the collectivism front, but he's drawing out of something down there in the sort of Vermont, you know, Yankee culture. And then on the Republican side just scanning through the candidates and who's most got, you know, strong regional valence. I don't know, it's a, it's a pretty eclectic group. I mean, is, is Trump a new Netherlander? I don't know. <laughs> but, oh, Jeb Bush, well, yeah, again, that's an interesting one. I, you know, 
But George W. Bush was definitely from the Deep South. I mean, his, his formative political career stuff was all sort of Brazos Valley and, and uh, when he went into politics and all that. And he ran on that sort of platform. But Jeb, I don't know that he's necessarily running on that. And he's from a state that, I mean, okay, you want to talk about where are the weaknesses in the paradigm? Because the paradigm is saying, you know, via Wilbur Zielinski, that the initial settler group sets down the institutions and stuff that are lasting, and that they can absorb huge numbers of people who come later, even if the initial settlement group was quite small. Where is that weakest? It's at weakest at moments when uh, the settler group came pretty recently, and there weren't very many of them, and thereafter some staggering flood of people came in. And that's true of two places on this map, LA, which was undeniably part of El Norte, uh, but the population base was very small. And then in the post-war period, millions of people from outside the region came in. And the other is Central Florida around Orlando, undeniably settled by the Deep South, but the population was incredibly sparse. And then, of course, same thing, millions of people from the outside. Those that, you know, the paradigm will say that over time, the cultures will win out. Will they? My guess is yes in LA, Maybe not in Orlando, and that zone is kind of where Jeb Bush is positioned, and it's a really funny spot for my paradigm to deal with, so he's a tough one too. So I wish there were easy answers because it would make you know, my you know, promoting the great paradigm in the media much easier, so I'm hoping that the parties pick some nominees that do in fact have strong valence. Um, but believe me, I want to answer your question, but so far I don't see it. We have a question from the floor. Yes, sir. Right. Again, I have another slide I show sometimes. You know, you look at the uh, the county census results in 1900 after the Great Migrations, the older Great Migrations of people, and you and they were traced by foreign-born. What percentage of the population is foreign-born? And you look at the map, and essentially, you know, the the, the darker the the shading, uh, the more foreign-born population there was, and it's just completely white with no foreign-born people exactly along the contours of the Greater Appalachia, the Deep South, and Tidewater. So. Essentially, no immigration from the great waves came into those three cultures. And it was concentrated, not surprisingly, in the Midlands and New Netherland, which are, the, the idea is multi-ethnic and cultural pluralism to begin with. So it's a welcoming place for immigrants because it's defined by being a society of many cultures living side by side. You've got your farm and your farm, we all meet here. And we have a checkerboard city of ethnic neighborhoods and that's fine. You each retain your own culture side by side. But, you know, Yankees don't go for that. You're gonna assimilate in the melting pot. We'll make you like us, you know, come along. We'll, we'll teach you how to use the fork the way we do kind of thing, whereas the Midlands, you can have the side-by-side -side cultures. So not surprisingly, there was a lot of uh, concentration uh, in the Great Waves there and in Yankeedom despite all that assimilative behavior because there were jobs there. And then in the Scandinavian migration into the uh, upper Midwest, huge numbers, the biggest, most highest concentrations were in the Norwegian and Danish and Swedish uh, areas in the upper Midwest. But that has a factor, a stickiness because as the, you know, I remember I mentioned the Yankee missionaries out there on the frontier trying to save the Midwest from the Kentuckians. Oh, they'll corrupt our children, you know. You know we must keep them at bay. They, were, they had their own, uh, the American Home Missionary Society Journal, and they had their, they were they're basically writing to each other, you know, writing reports back from the frontier, from there be dragons, I'm in Wisconsin, you know. But um, they would send back reports, and the reports were all that, how wonderful the Scandinavians were because they were very much like New Englanders, you know, sharing uh, the tradition of a state church, Lutheran slash uh, New England Puritan, and the you know frugality and all that. So the the two mesh together. So I'm saying in the context of that, there was self-sorting by the immigrants themselves, which increased the differences between the regional cultures in key respects. Now I would argue that today something similar is probably going to happen as well. Even though, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, where you're from, the idea is, you know, you, your grandchildren will probably have assimilated into this when we fast forward far enough. And that, you know, that cultures do change. I'm not saying that these things are immutable. France changes. You know, Britain changes when you have large numbers of people coming from somewhere else, and it becomes richer and the, all these wonderful things, and that's excellent, but there's this fundamental metronome of certain things about English culture or Yankee culture or French culture that survive and persist despite that over the generations, and I would say the same thing is going to happen here because North America is no different than the old world in those regards. It'll operate just the way it does in Europe with immigration. Let's give Colin Woodard a hand. Thank you. Thank you.